All right, hello, hello everyone, and welcome to another Nonprofit Enthusiast Live. I am so excited to be here with Mr. Joe Tolliver. Hey, hey, hey Joe. How, How are you doing? doing? I'm Good. doing okay. I feel like it's been a while. I'm glad to I know, be right? live again with you. Yeah, um, I know. <laughs> my favorite thing to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and especially one of my favorite topics, we're talking about program and services today. So I'm excited. Okay. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Um, if you're here, give us a hey, good morning in the chat box. Oh, I see you all already. Um, good morning, Shay. Hey, Trey, thank you for tuning in. Good morning, Brenda. Thank you for tuning in. All right, I see you all are pumped and ready for this conversation today. Once again, um, if you have a friend that needs to hear about this topic of program and services, go ahead and tag them in the chat. Remember, if they're not in the group, you have to go out and invite them first and then tag them into the chat so that way they can um, tune into this conversation today. Um, if you're catching us on replay, you know we always love to know who catches on replay. Give us a hashtag replay in the chat box. Uh, I'm just so excited. This is one of my favorite topics and I'm so excited to get to it. Uh, so we're going to give it a little, a couple minutes but start out by thanking our sponsor. So this month's sponsor we have is Aces Matter. And you all last week, Cindy came on and we talked about adverse childhood experiences. It was absolutely amazing. If you missed it, make sure you check that out in the group. Um, but ACES Matter is a grassroots organization dedicated to preventing ACES, intervening when they occur and educating people about them. They provide access to high quality training, support and expert services through donation based webinars with the goal of creating healthier adults and sustainable communities. So special thanks to ACES once again for being this month's sponsor. Um, ACES Matter for being this month's sponsor. Please check them out, learn more with, uh, about them. We're gonna drop that in the chat box, along with register for our next awareness party that we have. We've been doing these awareness parties on a monthly basis, um, providing it at no cost when typically these trainings do cost. Um, and we encourage you to tune in and join so you can register using the link in the chat. All right. Um, once again, if you're here, let us know that you're here and we're going to jump right into it. So this month's theme is programs and services. And Joe, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. And I'm glad to be able to kick it off um, with you. Um, just you're actually the expert. Nah, I didn't even say that. Well, okay, yes, I met maybe a little. Uh, I, you know, I really although truly... you've got awards for program design, so I have. You yep, know, I I'll have. be, I'm gonna be leery about what I say now. <laughs> we'll go back and forth. No, I yes, I have won awards for several programs that um I've been able to start from the uh, ground up. A lot of both of them were youth um based programs. One was around. STEMs for girls. Uh, so STEM, it's, it's called Sigma, STEM inspire girls to move ahead. Isn't that cute? You know, I like, you know, yeah, us and the acronyms. Right? Yep. <laughs> You're right at home with them. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And the other one was a young entrepreneurs program before it became a common thing. So um, yes, those were two programs that I built. I just love, and we won um, awards locally and nationally for both of them. So yes, I love programs. And we know that, um, and why this, we chose this topic for this month is because we know programs and services is the menu for a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. I like to say, you know, like when you go to a restaurant, if the menu is blank, what are you going to buy? Right. right so right. a lot of times as organizations, we like to jump right in and say, hey, we want funding, but we have no program and services. We have nothing to sell. Um, so before we dive into all of that, Joe, if you don't mind just first um, giving us a, just telling us a little bit about your journey in that space of program and serve some of the things that you've done um in that area when it comes to program and services and i know you've done everything i Joe know i don't know where to start <laughs> <laughs> i i have done a lot in the program and services area in, in my tenure at um two nationally affiliated nonprofits. um i started off in direct service you know, I managed a direct service program that went into schools that did peer to peer programming. I, I really started off volunteering for that program. Mm -hmm. And um, it, was, it was called Drug Free Youth in Town. And it really focuses on prevention in terms of 
young people not just saying no, but giving them the tools to say no, and why would they say no? Mm -hmm. um, we were heavily back in those days on the Hawkins and Catalina model, which talked about the 40 developmental assets and risk and protective factors. Mm -hmm. And we worked through that to really develop programs that were reflective of the community, but was also that we served, but was also evidence-based because during this time, there was a real trend, upward trend towards providing evidence-based program. Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot in the area. I think my starting point was really direct services. When I was in direct services, there was something that I realized on the ground, which kind of changed my perspective. Some of the evidence-based programming that was coming through really didn't match up to the folks that we serve. It didn't have the same types of language, didn't have the same kind of look and feel, and it did not resonate as well with the audience. And typically because some of these evidence-based programs were rigored in parts of the country um, that were more rural than urban, and I was mm -hmm. serving in an urban pocket. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was very hard to maintain the efficacy of the program when you feel and you don't feel, I should say, that is really making an impact. And so you mm -hmm. always felt the need to tweak, I always felt the need to. So that was kind of the thing that really um, started to make me think about taking what I had learned for many years on the ground, doing direct service, and then you mm -hmm. know, it, what would I do with that next? How do I become an advocate, a champion for good programming moving past that point? So that's really how I got into leadership management my desire to make a change about some of the programming that we were having to do that we felt, and you know, some of my colleagues felt wasn't really making the kind of impact um, that it should, given the fact that it was expensive, evidence-based don't come cheap. And um, right. that it was highly recommended by the folks who funded us. So those were some of my early days of nonprofit, but in, in the work that I've done in programs and youth services, but I've done everything, Lachine, in terms of mm -hmm. designing programs, um, implementing programs, uh, monitoring programs as a grants uh, manager. Um, so I've the whole gambit of anything you probably could ask me about them, I could probably share. Love it, love it, love it. And if you're tuning in and you have questions, you might be in building your program, whatever you might have in the areas of program and services for your nonprofit, feel free to drop those questions in the chat box. Um, Definitely, because that is the very thing, Lashina, excuse mm -hmm. me, uh, that is the very thing that is keeping uh, newer nonprofit organizations from prospering, from reaching mm -hmm. the kind of success that they need, because they don't have an effective, not just the program design, but an effective right. program design, one that kind of evaluates itself to see how effective it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you can always go back and tweak it, but you have to know what's wrong. In order for you to, to know what's wrong, you can't be at the end of the process, that evaluation process needs to start at the beginning, right? right As you develop right. that program. And you know, here at Nonprofit Enthusiasts, we have one real remedy that we recommend for program development, and that is our logic model. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, the logic model that Lachine and I have been working with nonprofits with is one that's kind of come out of our experiences. Um, there are probably a a thousand different types of logic models that you can use. They've been using them since the 70s, started out using them um, in the Pentagon. But now they are much more user-friendly. They really create a roadmap for a nonprofit organization in terms of the programs that they want. And it has five major buckets, right? That I always like to share with folks. And those five major buckets are Mm -hmm. Machina is shaking her head because we talk about this a lot because it's so important. We do. If yep, yep, it is. really wrap their head around the ability to identify what problem that they want to solve, what contributes to that problem. Mm -hmm. And then three, what strategy you believe that your organization can come up with and do to solve that problem. And then if you have that strategy, if you come up with it, then what are specific actions that you can take based on those strategies? If you've got the strategies, you've got the actions. The last one is outcomes. What do you expect to get at the end? And really that is the essence of what we believe is a comprehensive program and service design that anybody then can pick up, right? And really run with and be successful. Yep. 
So programming to me is expressly your design is the pinnacle of uh, your nonprofit organization. It really fuels everything. It fuels the resources. It fuels the volunteerism. It fuels your champions. And mm -hmm. it also fuels your passion, which is why you really got into this, right? You got into it because you're passionate about the work that you want to do. What the logic model does and what we do uh, by using the tool at Nonprofit Enthusiasts is we take your passion, right? And when we add structure mm -hmm. to it, so then mm -hmm. you can be successful without having to go through the surmountable roadblocks that most new nonprofits who go alone, you don't have to go through. And that's the beauty of this. That's the beauty of having um, sessions like these, Lashina. You know, we get to yep. kind of share, you know, years of this experience about like how programming is so important and how um, when you do the programming and you think about when it's a design that really works for your target audience, right? Mm -hmm. When you're that clear and that intentional to know that it not only has to be effective, but it also has to resonate with the folks that you're serving. Right. I don't know, you could probably kind of talk to me about how do you get to that, you know, some of the strategies that we've done in trying to rigor some of our programs ourselves is focus groups. Like yep. we take some of our experiences and take some of our um, tools and put them around people to see whether or not it resonates with them. Um, one of the things that I found that worked really well with young people was to tap into them at their talent. Mm -hmm. So they really love music. They really love uh, rap and, and spoken word. So we use that as a part of a behavioral change tool and attitude, really perception change as a programming tool. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's many ways that you can get to the success and to create um, the impact that you want. And it can be fairly designed to fit your target audience. Yep. I love, and, and, and really quick, cause you just unlocked something that um, I think is important for nonprofits to understand which is the portion of having a logic model for your organization and we're not just saying that as like oh it sounds good this is something we we do day in day out we're helping organizations build their logic model and why we continue to do it and why organizations love it is because it works um it gets all of those thoughts out of your head it helps the organization and their stakeholders and their champions be able to um, talk about their organization and the programs associated more confidently. Mm -hmm. um, even when um, we're going through the logic model process with organization, I feel like I know their mission. I feel like I know what they're out to do. I feel like I know their buckets. I, I, I also get that clarity as a part of that, um, the journey as well. So imagine what those board members are getting that's on these, um, that's sitting around the table and doing developing these with us. So I just want to emphasize we that's something that you know we continue to do and we just pretty much when you're like oh my gosh I want to start a program I don't know how that we're telling you that's it start with your logic model that's yes. the starting place if you called us and you said to us look I want to start an organization I want to do something like this something like this but I'm just not sure guess where we're going to tell you we need to develop a logic model Right. Um, so I just want to make sure, you know, those tuning in understand that that that's a key, you know, to helping you develop. And it's something that a lot of organizations, a lot of nonprofits do not do. So that are that in itself puts you um, in a very good place in comparison to other organizations that are doing um, similar work because you have that clarity and you've done that work uh, up front. Uh, something else you talked about was the focus group. Um, and, and that's key and that's very important. And I know the programs that I've developed, I always like to start with the pilot phase um, and not assuming that we're jumping right into it. So like for instance, the um, program, um, both of those programs that I talked about, those youth-based programs, they all started out in pilot at um, one or two schools is how I used to um, do them. We'll pilot at one or two schools, we'll um, get the feedback from those students, we'll make those improvements, and then we'll go into full implementation. So we went from one to two schools to expanding it to, for one of the programs, it went over to 14 schools. Um, and then another program, it went out to 28 schools. So we had to start small, work the tweaks, you know, work out any um, 
challenges, talk to the students because that was our target audience, get their feedback, incorporate that feedback um, into it. it. For the entrepreneurship program, we were talking to those entrepreneurs, trying to see what they felt you know, um, they can lend to this program. And then we were able to tweak it you know, go ahead and uh, kind of, you know, fix those certain areas and go into full implementation and grow um, that each of those programs in that way. So don't be scared to pilot is what, um, you know, and, and I honestly recommend organizations start with that pilot phase, not going, not that you're going to give everything as if it's a full implementation, but knowing that there's room to um, continue to improve and being very intentional about what that looks like with your focus group, your surveying, your different portions on how you're going to get those uh, that information back. You know, two things that I like to say, um, sometimes, first, sometimes folks get um, the idea that they can only do one type of program. So mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about maybe three types of programming. First, individualized programming, which is the type of program that we're accustomed to. You're trying to make an impact in an individual's life whether it's a youth, whether it's an adult, um, you're, you're individualizing that service program to work with that individual, whether you're working with that individual and the environment that individual works in, lives in or works and play, right? Mm -hmm. That's individualized programming. Then there's environmental programming, right? Which seeks to look at changing perceptions or behaviors of large groups of folks. That program is more steered to um, focusing in on larger groups. Um, an example of a uh, environmental strategy or population level change is what you're trying to do versus just changing the individual. You might run a, a prevention campaign at a particular school that it could impact 1500 schools where you're targeting them on a specific issue, but you're making it more universal, mm -hmm. more general and more open to a public forum. So that's the second kind, you have individual, you have environmental, and then you have advocacy programming where you're working with groups of people to change norms in a particular community or in a particular school, right? And that could come through policy change, legislation, local laws, right? So those are three really um, different types of programming that most nonprofits can participate in. Um, there's, there's not just one way. Oftentimes we get caught up in just doing the individualized and fail to see the impact that can be created when you do um, something more broad, more population level change, or miss the opportunity to change a norm in a particular community, which really was the issue in the beginning, right? Or mm -hmm. it could possibly be that norm could possibly be what we like to refer to as a root cause. Mm -hmm. It only can be rectified by changing a policy or changing a law or inserting some legislation to make an impact. But remember, your impact will drive your resources versus your resources driving your impact. Yep. So what the logic model does is tells the story of the impact that you're going to create. It will mm -hmm. drive the resources you need to get to work. But you can't, don't think of it as the other way around. You really need to create the impact in order for you to obtain and be in position to receive the resources. And those resources can be not just monies, but it could be volunteerism. It could be, you know, um, champions, people who want to join your board. It could be all types of in-kind um, types of things to help your program along. But people want to focus on impact and that impact will help drive your resources. So you mean as a nonprofit, I shouldn't go running and trying to get all these funds before I develop my program? Absolutely not. Because <laughs> what are you telling them that you're going, they're going to fund? Right. Any seasoned funder would want you to be very description. As a matter of fact, when you finish with that logic model, you could basically take that over to your friendly neighborhood grant writer and tell them to go to work, to actually go look for grants that fit the programming that you've designed versus you tweaking and changing who your organizational identity is to fit a grant because you want the funding but you really don't have the capacity to be successful at that grant. And oftentimes mm -hmm. you go into starvation and oftentimes you end up giving those dollars back. And what that leads to is a bad reputation, which makes it even harder for you to get future funding. Yep. So true. So it's very important um, 
for organizations to invest in your program and your services. Um, And that's why we dedicated this whole month to this conversation to just make sure that we have program and services that are marketable, um, impactful, you know, making a difference in the community. Because remember, without program and services, your organization pretty much does not exist. You know, there's there's no there's nothing that you're offering. Um, um, So definitely making sure that you have um, very good and very strong uh, program and services. I love my food reference because I feel like it it just makes the most sense. (laughs) Like, you know, if you go into a restaurant and you get that watered down food and you don't enjoy, are you likely to go back? You know, like it's the same type of concept in a nonprofit, you know, having that high quality programming. um, And a lot of that has to do with the planning and structure Um, that you put into place. I'm going to go over to chat really quick and then we can um, continue. So, hey, Tanya, thank you for, um, and I hope I said that right. I don't think I did. Um, uh, um, Thank you for tuning in. (laughs) I remember last week. Um, Okay, so I I wish I would have started my program with a logic model back in 2004. The good news is it's not too late. Um, you definitely can go back and develop a um, logic model. And something we didn't talk about with the logic model is um, it has a lot of different opportunities that can assist you with um, your strategic planning processes and so forth. We didn't talk about all of that because we're focused in on the program piece, but a logic model, that the portion we talked about is just the starting point. There is so much more you can do um, with that logic model. And don't hesitate to give us a call and we'll you know, talk about how we can assist you and support you in the logic model um, development um, process. And remember, logic model simply means the theory of change, how you plan to make the change mm-hmm. that you hope to see in the folks that you want to serve or in the communities that you want to serve. That's all a logic model is. Just a logical representation of how you hope to make change, impact. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. They're big words, I guess, to some extent, because they're not common. Um, yep. But uh, for us folks in the nonprofit industry, it is something that needs to be common. It needs to be one of the first things you do in terms of developing your, or your nonprofit organization is develop your program. And there's no yep. better way to develop it than the utilization of a logic model. Yep. Love it. Anything else in around program and services that you want to share? And I love that you touched on that advocacy piece as well. Um, that um, and, and just broke down. You know, you, there's individual there, um, programming, there's environmental, and there's also advocacy um, opportunities as well. So that you know, as nonprofit organizations, you're right. We instantly think, okay individual, you know, depending on the nature of the organization, right. or maybe sometimes environmental, but not thinking about the other changes that can be brought about through um, the work that we're doing. I'll tell you, one of the programs that I managed when I was at the United Way was called the Broward Youth Coalition. And mm-hmm. it was a coalition of youth leaders that were trained. Oh, Lachine, I'm sorry, you were a part of that as well, right? I was. <laughs> high schoolers <laughs> who were trained to mentor middle schoolers and elementary school students. But a part of what you guys did in that was to really develop a strategic prevention framework around how to prevent young people from substance abuse. And it was so simple. Mm -hmm. We trained you guys up to be leaders. You went back and mentored your peers. And Mm -hmm. it was a great program that lasted, what, eight, nine years. And uh, I, I know many young people like yourselves came out of that seeing their commitment to volunteerism and, and increased altruism, including yourself who went on to college, mm-hmm. right? To get yep. a degree in nonprofit, yep. um, to have your own nonprofit organization, to have your own mm-hmm. social enterprise. So sometimes, yep. you know, we think when we're working and I'll say this for myself, we're working with these young people, you know, you never know what their life will be from the programs that you put into their world, right? Mm-hmm. You never know what life will turn out for them. And I encourage anybody who's out there who's doing programming, Lashina is a prime <laughs> example of what your work can do and what it can right. produce in this world. So, you know, I'm very yep. uh, proud to say all that too, not just because. Yes. You- I love and and I love that you brought that up especially if you're tuning in so you talked about two programs that in high school I was a part of and if you don't know um Joe and I go way way back (laughs) 
<laughs> and um, um, in, in, in high school, you know, Joe's talking about these programs. I participated in these programs. So yeah, you're right. These programs work. Um, right. Here we are years later. I didn't know I wanted to go into um, um, work with social impact organizations or nonprofits or even do my formal education in nonprofit. And I didn't know I was being molded way back then. You know oh, yeah. what I mean? Uh, <laughs> uh, so these programs work. Um, so, yes. And, 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 and I think it's important to say that because even with me, when I when I um, was working with youth, sometimes you don't automatically see the impact. You don't see it like this. You know, and, and you have to remember, but when they come back and say, hey, I'm doing this now, or this is what's happening, or remember that time you said that to me, um, and you're like, mm -hmm. they were listening, you know. Just, <laughs> sometimes you just get a chance to plant a seed, right? right That's right. all you may get. So yep. you really should take advantage of it. Yes. But I know yes. that, you know, I kind of switched the subject just a little bit, but if there are any questions about programs uh, folks want to ask me, because sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So just ask anything. Right. Yep. If you have any questions, drop them in the chat. Um, all right. Claudine says, good job. She is awesome. Thank you, Claudine. Yep. Claudine, we got to get you on. Claudine's our insurance person. We got to get you on a live. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, Tanya. Um, I didn't, she said, I didn't either. I thought I wanted to be a nurse. And it's so true, you know, like, I, and that's why even one of the programs through um, my nonprofit now is in career and college readiness, because I remember being exposed to very little. Um, and if we can expose the, the youth to a lot more and give them a menu of options, um, you know, it's much, uh, it gives them that option that they can choose where they want to go um, and um, after, you know, life after high school. Um, all right, Claudine, I'm gonna hold you to it. She said, it's going to happen. All right. We're going to be on live together. Yay. <laughs> um, awesome. Anything else, Joe? I know we touched on quite a bit, um, today, anything else that you feel that, uh, in the areas of program and services, as we kick off this month's conversation that we, um, need to go or, or any final thoughts? Well, I like to say like, you, you didn't ask me what my favorite type of program was. So. Oh, sorry. Because you have so many. I'm no, telling you. I have a favorite. I actually do have a favorite. <laughs> Joe has de developed or, or worked on like a lot of different types of programs. So I am going to be very interested to hear. I'm going to ask you, mm -hmm. what is your favorite program? Well, old school. I like wraparound. Ah. Like wraparound. Um, if I'm working with an individual, I have to work with that individual um, in different pockets of that individual's life. Um, at the school level, at the parent level, at the community level. Um, I want to be engaged with that individual at all those points of entry. Therefore, I believe I have the greatest opportunity for success. Because especially if it's a young person, if I'm working with that young person, I mm -hmm. still have to send that young person back onto fertile ground in order for them to grow and be successful. So I am a big advocate of programs that look at the entire family the individual, the family, and the school, and the community within they, within that child looks, lives in, that youth lives in. That's my favorite. I love it. Programming. I love it. I love it, love it. And, and that, that is true, because sometimes we'll have students, and like a lot of my, the programs um, that I work with is after school, out of school time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'll have the school takes care of that school day portion. Then yeah. we'll take care of that after school portion. And then we send them home. And then what? You know, so yes, having that wrap around where the parents are getting the support they need and all of that um, definitely can create a, a bigger impact for that youth. Then what to what? Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, we be able to make sure that to what is as right. healthy as we possibly can, right? Yeah. Just physical health, emotional health, mental health, uh, financial health. Um, if you find that a student is struggling in school and academically, it may be the parent that's struggling mm -hmm. as well that can't help that young person, right? So yep. how do we help that parent? Well, we help that parent through educational resources. That's mm -hmm. the kind of services I believe have, creates the biggest impact. Um, Love it. You know, I'm old school. I don't even know if they even call that any, that anymore. <laughs> I know I haven't heard those words. I remember you used to always hear the words, you know, wrap around, wrap around. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for instance, yeah. Lashina, like what you talk all the time, I sponsor this month is ACES. If I could, right. I have 
tool that was similar to ACES. But if I had a tool like ACES, back in the day, one of the first things we would do is provide case management services at our after school programs. Right. That was important for us. So we provide case management service. We could tap right into that young person and their living environment. We're right at the school, typically with that after school program. So we could tap into the school. And primarily, we understand the community for which they live in and what pieces of the puzzle it plays um, with the success of that young person. Mm -hmm. So having the, all that information and would and if I would have had the ACES tool as well, man, right. we could have been unstoppable. But you guys today have those resources. Right, right. You know? That's so true. to have the ability to evaluate a person at that level and then make some assertions about what could be a healthy resolve for that person is, is huge. Not yep. to say that we could not do that, but it sure wasn't as easy as you guys can do it today. Right. Yep. Yep. And then that adverse um, childhood experience um, survey is only 10 questions. You know how many questions it used to have to take to be able to get down to? <laughs> the questions half the time. So I know. Right. You know, 30 questions, I'm figuring out how do I get down to 25? Because nine times out of 10, you're not going to get through through the 30. Or you right. worn them out by the time you get through 30. You know, so. Yep. Those were, those were the days, those were tools that I still think can create because when you're doing assessments like that, it does what I think is the most important. It moves away from putting band-aids and looking at surface issues and really gets you down to the nitty gritty, the root causes mm -hmm. of the challenges. And that's where those resources will come into play. Yep. So if Love I had them. ideal programming, it would definitely be old school wraparound Bring it back. Love it. With aces as the 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 carrot. Yes. Yes. Love it. Yes. Love it. And and that's a perfect segue into our sponsor. Um, it, uh, uh, make sure that you check out um, Aces Matter. Um, and we've been hosting these awareness parties for nonprofit organizations for you all at no cost. And this typically does cost um and then uh, money to operate. Um, so. Because of that, we strongly encourage you, your staff, to join us for these uh, awareness parties. Is really, um, it, it, it's it's very, I want to say, laid back, so to speak. You could come on, have your uh, have your dinner. You know, you don't have to come on to camera if you don't want to. A very relaxed environment, and where we're pretty much watching and learning more about adverse childhood experiences, so that we can go back and then share that within our community. Um, so definitely make sure that you register for one of our awareness parties. Um, I definitely encourage you to tune in for those awareness parties because um, the more that we know about our own adverse childhood experiences, the better we can serve our community and then also in incorporate that into that, our program so we can know more about those that we're serving so we can dive deeper um, into the services that they need and how we can provide those services. So that's one of the reasons that we, we're hosting these awareness parties in conjunction with nonprofit, um, with ACES Matter is because we truly believe that this is uh, um, a very good uh, uh, conversation and way to get nonprofits uh, trauma aware and eventually leading to them becoming trauma informed. Mm. Um, because, you know, we work with a lot of very sensitive um, uh, populations and we want to be mindful of that, and, you know, and being able to meet their needs, um, knowing our own, um, what we kind of went through. And that's why I like it. Cause when I've done the ACEs, it kind of, um, shed light on my own, um, experiences and like, wow. So is this why I do this as an adult? You know, it, it got me to think a little bit deeper in that. And then also to think about when when that person lashes out, that client walks in and they just mad at you and you didn't do anything um, with them. Think about all the experiences that they um, had before they even walked into the door um, with you. Think about what their night may have been like. So I think that's why I, I, I truly believe attending these awareness parties, learning more about adverse childhood experiences. Um, and they have the negative adverse childhood experiences and positive childhood experiences um, to help you better serve your clients, no matter who um, they are in that human service um, sector of the nonprofit field. So definitely, 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 please. You're providing case management services. You know, it's a great right. tool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we'll drop that information in the chat. Definitely learn more about ACEs Matter. And one way you can get started if you're like, I don't know about adverse childhood experiences is join our awareness party. 
And you'll find a video in a group from last week when um, Cindy from ACES Matter came on and talked about um, just that and what that looks like uh, in our community on a day-to-day -day basis. So please make sure that you um, check that out. Um, in addition, we'll go ahead and drop if you have, um, if you want to talk more about your program services, go ahead, feel free to learn more about nonprofit enthusiasts and feel free to schedule a consult with us. Um, we'll drop that information in the chat box as well. We love talking to you. Um, the cool thing is when you schedule a consult, guess who it's with? Um, it's either with Joe or myself. <laughs> So there's no no one else. You're going to either talk to one of us and we'll be able to talk to you a little bit, not just about the logic model, just your organization as a whole. And yeah, we um, talk some about your organization, the work that you're doing and then how we can help. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And I love to give a couple of tidbits. I know it's only like, what is it, 15 minutes? I have not done 15 minutes yet, but I'll try. <laughs> you know, it usually be around 20, 30, but it, it you know, it's a lot to kind of yep. sure and, you know, to bring forth like the, the, the thing that you need to do. And I want to give you a space to tell your story. Listen, yep. this social impact industry is about telling your story. Mm -hmm. That is one of the key components of this is telling your story. And in order for you to tell your story, it starts off with telling folks about your program and how effective it has been or how effective you hope it will be. Mm -hmm. And this is why you believe it would be effective. You know, that's the whole thing about program services. And if yep. your program services has the tenacity, the ability, right, to get down to root causes, that's even a bigger win, right? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that I would highlight as folks should consider. And I didn't want to let today go by without mentioning Happy Black History Month, Lashina. Yes, Happy Black History Month. I yep. know there are a lot of African Americans in nonprofits and um, want to celebrate um, that with you all, um, the work that we all do. Um, the one thing that I've known and I've, I've had the experience to know is that you don't come into doing this work, creating this type of impact by chance, by luck, by coincidence. Most times you're called to do this work and you almost have a hard time figuring out that you're doing work because what you get from it is so rewarding. Um, it just uh, pans out some of the negativity, the long hours, right? Lashina, you, you know about long hours, right? I know about those long hours. We require long hours. The emotional toll, because you have to listen mm -hmm. and you have to, you have to really, if, you, if you're good, you're listening to these stories. Mm -hmm. So at some point you're, you're empathizing with these folks on a daily basis. It is not easy work to do. And um, I encourage and applaud everybody who's out there doing program services. Mm -hmm. um, from the people who deliver the direct service to the people who makes the decisions on what services gets delivered. They all mm -hmm. play an important role, right? But they all need to be in sync about mm -hmm. their work. And I'll say this last point. You get a grant writer to write a grant for an existing program, refunding for a program you're already doing. And that grant writer have never experienced or talked to the people who are working the program. That's, hmm. a, that's one of the biggest defaults that you can do in the programming is to write a program that your staff cannot do. Mm, 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 all the time. Mm. And nothing frustrates a staff more than to be disconnected from the grant writing process for which they have to work. So Ooh, that, 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 hit, a, that no, hit me. <laughs> <laughs> I had some flashbacks <laughs> on that. <laughs> Who wrote this is like, what are you talking about? Is the, the thing that you find yourself saying, right? Because it doesn't work on the ground. It works in a uh, black and blue. Ooh. But when you get it to the ground, look, folks, be very careful of that, right? That's a good way Ooh. to get money back. Man, that hit like I have flashbacks like <laughs> that. That is so true. And I've lived that in the sense of I've been part of organizations where the grant writers don't talk to the program staff at any level. <laughs> um, and then you get this grant getting passed on to you and you're like, I'm supposed to do what? 
Okay. After every session, you want me to pre and post these kids? Do you know how much it takes to keep their attention? <laughs> a pre and post every session? session? Every session, not the beginning of the program after five weeks. Again, I had one like that. Every session, we pre. I'm like, are you serious? Or you have into program time? Or you have a program, a summer program, an eight week summer program. Your staffing pattern. You got your staff working from seven to seven in the morning to seven at night. Mm -hmm. Um, That's not good quality, right? Yep. Yep. It's hard to work with that many kids for that many hours. So um, the staffing pattern is a big no-no too, right? You got to yep. have reasonable staffing patterns for folks. Tap into their strengths and work your, your staffing patterns that way. So those are just a little hit and miss thing. Think about the summer coming up um, and programming during the summer, uh, especially your after school programming during the school year. Uh, those are very important. You know, we've had an opportunity to look at some after school programs recently. Mm-hmm. And there are a number of great things that are happening in after school programs. But we still are challenged in many times, right, to create the kind of services and programs that we know is resonating with those kids, no matter where we go. Mm-hmm. And sometimes mm-hmm. we can have canned programs um, that you could use across the board but do they really fit in this particular community? Hence, celebrate, mm-hmm. you know, Black History Month. Does it work, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think folks need to be careful about looking at whether your program works. When you have a logic model, Lashina, mm-hmm. the, effective of, the effectiveness of your program is already being measured in a mm-hmm. full, complete, functional logic model. So you yep. know at the end of that programming session or season, whether you made an right. impact or not. Right. If you didn't, you retweet. Yep. If you did, you keep moving forward. But you got to build it in, right? Mm-hmm. And you got to necessarily not focus so much in on canned programs. It may work in one community, but may not work in another. So mm-hmm. Those are things to consider. Yes, love it. And I could see that in the chat that others felt that when you when you talked about um, the grant writer and the um, program team not being connected and working in sync and you know um, so forth. So we have good one. Uh, Claudine mentioned and and you could get you know sued you know depending on the um, th- and not having that um, connection. And then Tania said with a zillion requirements, that's right. And sometimes I've seen it where sometimes the grant doesn't even require all of that, but the grant writer built it in. So yeah. now you're required to do it. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. But you so, don't yes. have a problem when you have a logic model, right? right. Because you exactly. specifically what you're doing, what your outputs right. are, what your outcomes are. So you really don't have right. challenges. And you tell your grant writer, look, this is what we do. This is what we right. do. And we don't do anything else now. So don't try to write us in, right? Right. Really <laughs> thing, especially when you're reading the RFP, you get that RFP and it doesn't match up to what you do. You shouldn't apply for it. Agreed. You shouldn't yeah. apply. For it. it really yeah. is going down a rabbit hole that may be more consequential than just losing the money. It could mm-hmm. forfeit you from getting more money and create a reputation. Mm-hmm. I said this before that you don't want to have. Be ready to receive, have the readiness to receive those dollars by having a program that's in place that you can measure and evaluate at any given point and that you can talk to a funder about why you believe that this program Mm -hmm. should be funded. You can talk to a community about why you think this program should be in this community because here's the program here, look at it. Here you go. Mm -hmm. You could talk to a volunteer about joining your board because you got a solid program and here's how you're going to work it. Here's how effective it's going to be. You can talk a uh, donor into giving you money on an individual basis because you got a solid program that you know that you're going to get the outcomes that's needed to make the kind of impact that's needed for that particular community. It all starts with being able to tell your story. The logic mm-hmm. model does that for you. It sure does. Love it. Mm-hmm. So 
we have dropped a lot of tips, so I won't go over tips from today's session. But as far <laughs> as homework, <laughs> making sure that you're taking a look at your programs and services within your organization um, and kind of looking at where improvements can be made. It, um, do you need, well, you know, we recommend even if you don't have one to go ahead and start a log the logic model process going in. It's perfect. It's February. You're still early on in the year where you can go through this process and, you know, be able to implement it throughout the next few years. Um, so, you know, take a look at that. So look at your program and services, um, especially as we continue this conversation throughout the month and definitely tune in to our lives this month as we continue to just talk about different aspects when it comes to program and services. So, um, Joe, thank you for coming on today and helping me kick off this month's conversation. All right. All right. And thanks for, right. for sponsoring us. Yes, 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 yes. And you're going to be hearing more and learning more as we go out um, through the month regarding um, adverse childhood experiences and ACEs matter. So definitely please make sure that you check them out and tune in for one of our um, awareness parties that we'll be hosting. Too, to our folks in the Facebook group. Yes. They stay yes, on yes, point, yes. Don't they? they keep growing mm -hmm. and staying in point by inviting their friends. So we appreciate yes. it. And we hope that some of the programming that we're giving you is helping. Mm -hmm. Hope it is. Please give us a thumb up. Encourage us. Yes, keep us encouraged, right? Keep us encouraged, right? <laughs> we've been doing this for almost over a year every Thursday, or I'll say every week, because there has been some weeks that we had to do it on a Tuesday, but we've been committed to the process. We've been here with y'all every week. So yes, give us a thumbs up, invite your friends, um, show up to these lives. That keeps us motivated and know that we're able to help you all. So please, 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 you know, continue let to show us up. Know what you want to talk about. Let us right. know some topics that you want to talk about. Yep. Between yep. Machina and I and some of the friends that we have in the social impact industry, we believe that we could help. Yep. Absolutely. And I'll tell you this. So like we're booked until April and I'm so grateful for it with guests that will be coming on throughout the month. And what that says to me is there's people that want to share this information with you all. Um, so yes, if you have an area, a topic that you want to talk about, um, just, sh you know, feel free, drop it in the group um, so that we can, we can arrange for that to happen for you all. And Lashina, one last thing. Can you share with them some of the upcoming exciting things that we're working on to get to them in the which, very which, near future? Which yeah. ones? Uh, the book, the podcast. Oh, oh, you're ready? Yeah. See, I'm there, y'all. See, I like to... <laughs> so we do have some exciting... I'm just going to talk. Look, so we it's do have you. some... You might as well share and put yourself on call. All right. <laughs> we are, yeah. And this is going to hold us responsible for doing these things, right? Um, so just like we talk about this process, and, and I, I'm just going to back up. We talk about the whole logic model process and building as well. And once again, we truly believe in it to the point we do it, right? So when we're doing our retreats every year, we are looking at our logic model, assessing, reassessing, and how we can grow, right? So this year, we do have some amazing, exciting things planned. Um, one is releasing um, our book. Uh, releasing a few things associated and connected with the book to help you all um, continue to grow on your journey. Um, it, it's going to be really, really good. It's going to point you from starting the starting point of your organization, whether you're small or, or medium size or large, um, from the very ground of compliance all the way to um, being uh, fundable or that fund development area. So we're going to hit the, the, you know, go from A to Z um, in this book. And, and Joe is challenging us to do it in less than 100 pages. So we're going to try, right? So, <laughs> so what's the name so of yes. the book again? <laughs> How to Become a Nonprofit Enthusiast in 100 Days. That's it. All right. So we're excited. Yep. So as we... Yep. So encourage us, continue to encourage us and pray for us. Um, we yes. are excited about the book. We're excited about the podcast to be able to talk to folks about, you know, the enthusiasm around creating social impact, right? There's a lot of enthusiasm mm -hmm. around it. It's not just relying on the government to do it. It's not just relying on, uh, you know, um, foundations to do it. It's the people. We go and we serve mm -hmm. our people, right? And so it's the privilege to be able to do that. So we're excited about being able to share some of these things with you guys and to really push this industry forward 
in a way that we believe that can be simple for folk, right? It's not mm-hmm. rocket science. It could be simple for folks and applicable, you know? So we're excited. Yep. About it. And so I kind of jumped the gun yes. and wanted to but sometimes you got to put <laughs> fire under yourself to make you go, go, he go. He definitely added the fire. I- <laughs> <laughs> go and grow. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. We're so excited. And we're so excited to be on this journey um, with you all, you know, on your nonprofit journey and then you joining us on our journey as well. So we're, yes, um, we definitely, Joe definitely made sure we threw some fire up under getting that book out ASAP because <laughs> I know it's going to help many organizations. So love it love it love it so and i see yes i see you all celebrating in the um <laughs> in the chat box thank you all so much thank you thank you thank you uh for all your support and continuing to tune in to our lives um and continuing to encourage us um we encourage each other right we're stronger together so we appreciate you all um all right so that's it for nonprofit enthusiast live today we will see you all next week next week we're going to have miss debbie pedraza from Foundation for Orange County Public School on. She's the executive director. Um, She is absolutely amazing. Whenever she comes on, she drops a lot of different um, uh, nuggets and and information for us to help us grow our organization. So please make sure you come back next week uh, and tune in to that session. Invite invite individuals to the group and then tag them in so they can um, join in on that session as well and catch all of these replays we have available for you um, in the guide section of the group as well. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you next week.